about the material we're about to cover. It's not that I'm not prepared. I just don't really, in my experience with this chapter 12, section 8, I've had a very, very difficult time explaining it in a way that I felt like my students understood it. And are y'all okay like that? Y'all are like right up on the board. Do y'all want to move back at all? Or? I think we should, yeah. yeah. Do y'all mind just like push that, y'all push all those desks that way and just make sure you leave a little bit of room. Okay, so the reason why I find it difficult to explain is because there's elements of the material that are beyond anything we've done. So I'd have to go and like show you all this stuff. Right? So it's like I'm going to give you a formula and I'm going to ask you to not ask me why that formula works. I hate doing that. But I'm telling you, the times I've tried to explain the formula, it hasn't been worth the effort. Because at the end, students don't get it. Because it's over material we haven't talked about. So um, with that said, I'm going to try my best. Uh oh. See, I knew today would go like this. I just knew it. You all right? Yeah. Is that water? Huh? Is that water? Yeah, that's water. Okay. Not other, not any other clear liquid. Um, okay, so let's, let's give it a shot, okay? Let's give this a shot. 12.8. I have notes for this. They're all online, but I'm not even going to go off those notes because, again, I think the notes are more confusing than anything else. So I'm just going to um, freehand this up here, all right? 12.8. Uh, it's called change of variables. Is this kind of thing, like one card system to another? Or? Oh, hang tight, I'll let you know. Yep. Okay. Now, good news. This is the last section, chapter 12, and then we will move into chapter 13, which is the last chapter of the book. So we will be getting close to finishing the textbook. All right, change of variables. So I'm going to ask you to remember um, something from uh, Cal 2. Let's say you had this integral right here. We did something like this in class last time. We had a problem similar to that. I think we had talked about it. Um, if you were to do this, you could just go look up the formula in the back of the book. But if you didn't have that formula and you were trying to do this integral, you would do a trigonometric substitution. You all remember that from Cal 2? Trig sub. All right, and the trigonometric substitution I would do here is based on the fact that I see something in that integral that looks like a squared minus x squared. And whenever you see a squared minus x squared, you would make a substitution x equals a sine theta. That's a trigonometric substitution. You all remember this co concept, right, from Cal 2? Now, what we just did was made a substitution, right? Why do we do this? Why do we make this substitution? because it makes it nice and it makes it doable, right? But what you're actually doing is changing the variable. The variable in the original problem is x, right? You're replacing x with something. That something has a new variable in it. So we have changed the variable, right? So let's see what happens if we were to actually do this problem over here. We would do x is uh, 3 sine theta, right? And then you could take the derivative of this, dx would be 3 cosine theta d theta, and then you could do the algebra that shows that the square root of 9 minus x squared simplifies to be 3 cosine theta. Again, I'm not going to go through all of this because you did this in Cal 2, but does it look familiar? Yes? Okay, so then we go rewrite the integral. When we re rewrite the integral, this part right here gets replaced with 3 cosine theta. Uh, no, it's not 3 sine theta. If you replace x with 3 sine theta right here and then square it and then factor out a 9 and then do formula, you get it. Okay. Identity. All right, so that's that. And then this is the part that, that's kind of going to lead us into today. 
What's happening here is that the dx is not being replaced with, with d theta, not directly. It's actually all of this, isn't it? It's all of that. Now you have your d theta there, but you also have to put a 3 and a cosine theta there, right? So that 3 cosine theta, d theta, replaces the dx, right? And then from there, you'd pull out the 3s, and this would be cosine squared, and then you'd do a power reducing formula, and then you'd go and you'd do your integration. It would be over, right? At the end, you would have to switch back to the original variable. But that's, that's what we did. So there was a give and a take. If we make a substitution, if we make a change of variable, we can do that. But every time we do it, there's going to be the potential that our dx out here is replaced with something else, like something else goes here, not just d theta. Understand? OK, so we want to do the same thing for double integrals. And what we want to try and determine is what, what pops out here in a double integral. So we've done this one time already when we converted to polar coordinates. When we did polar coordinates, which is what I'm about to put up here now, when we did polar double integrals, so let's say that we were going to do double integral over some region R of f of x, y, dA. So we've got some region, OK? And let me make this region look like a polar region, OK? So let's say that that's our region. We would have looked at that and we would have said, hey, that's a really good polar region, right? It's not a very good picture, is it? But you get it? OK. So we converted this to polar. And when we did that conversion, what we did is we made two substitutions. The first substitution we made is that everywhere we see x, we're going to replace it with r cosine theta, right? Yes. And everywhere we see y, we're going to replace it with r sine theta. This is very much like the trigonometric substitution that we just did, except we're replacing two variables, right? We're replacing both the x and the y. And we're replacing it with two new variables. What are our two new vari variables? R and theta. So we've converted our integral that was in terms of x and y into a new integral in terms of r and theta. Right? OK. But there's a give and a take for this. When we do this, this region is going to become much nicer. This was the region in the xy plane. But when we convert it over, we know that our, our new variables are, let's say, r and theta. OK? So when we do this conversion, our r is going to be between what? According to that picture, between two constants, right? So our r is going to be between two things. And our theta is also between two constants. So you could imagine that what we've done is we've taken this region here, r, and we've transformed it into a new region. Now, in linear algebra, this, these are called transformations. This is what this is. But I'm not going to get too technical about this. We have a transformation that is taking a region in R2 into, another, into R2. And when we map this region over, like this to this, this is a nicer region to integrate, right? This is better. We, we enjoy this more integration-wise um, than that. But when you do that, there's a, there's a little thing you have to do to compensate for the change that you just made. And I told you, with polar, you always have to remember to throw the r in there, right? And that r was the, was the give and the take. You have to put the r in there. And the reason why, and this is why, this is the part where I have to really kind of wave my hands a little bit, is that if you do a little sample area, like a, a, little, a little region here, the area of this, when it gets mapped over here, that little area into this region here, they're not the same areas. And because of that, you have to scale it. You have to somehow scale it by something. And when you do polar, you have to scale it by r. That's what's going on. And that's what I'm going to say. We're not going to get any deeper into that. All right? Now, the good news is that if you have a transformation, if you have a change of variables that's been um, established, there is an easy way to come up with what that scale factor has to be. For polar, we know it's r, right? But for any other 
change of variables you ever do, you need to know what that scale factor is, and there's a formula for that. And I'm going to give that to us, all right? All right. Now, before I give us the formula, we used r and theta here for our two new variables, didn't I? And that's because r was radius and theta was angle. But would it be OK if I had written x equals, let's say, u cosine v and y is equal to u sine v? Would this, give us this, would this have the same effect? It should, right? It's just I'm calling r u and I'm calling theta v. Then this would become u and this would become v. But all the pictures and all the integrals would be the same. I would have to throw something into the double integral, though. What would I have to throw in if I change this? I'd have to throw in u, right, into the integral. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because when we, when we try and generalize these changes of variables, when you change the x and y to something, it's not always going to be radius and angle. So to generalize it, we're just always going to use u and v, that somehow x is going to be transformed into something that has to do with u and v, and y is going to be transformed into something that has to do with u and v. And, and then we have the formula for coming up with that, uh, that scale factor. All right. We good? All right. So let's look at the note. I will bring this up from my notes. So I don't have to write it all on the board. There it is. OK. A little bigger. Let's see if I can do it. Yeah, that'll work. All right, so let's say that we have a function of two variables that we are trying to integrate over some region D with respect to area. So that means we have some region D, this is X and this is Y, and we're trying to integrate that. Then, if we can transform X and Y using some change of variables, in other words, if I can take X and replace it with some function of U and V. So what, what this means is X is equal to some function of u and v. x is a function of u and v. You plug in u and v and it's going to give you the new value of, uh, it'll give you a value of x. Yes? And you replace y, or you say y is equal to some other function of u and v. So that was like x was r cosine theta, y was r sine theta, or x was u cosine v and y was u sine v. That's what this is. So if you have this, change of variables, then this integral will become a new integral over a new region, S. So that new region, S here, hopefully is nicer than that one, okay? So like maybe it's, maybe it's a rectangle here, all right? This is now in U and V here. So this new integral, well, you'll be able to switch it to this new nice region, but you've got to go into your function, you've got to replace all your X's with that substitution, that change, you've got to replace all your y's with that change. We did that with polar, right? And then this part. This is the big part right here. Then you have to calculate this right here. It's partials. Okay, so let's look at what it is first. You are taking the partial of x with respect to u. So you're taking the partial of that equation with respect to u times, these are multiplications, the partial of y with respect to v, and then minus the partial of x with respect to v times the partial of, of y with respect to u. This, it's not really a chain rule, but this, is, this does have a name. It's a determinant. It's, it's actually called the Jacobian determinant. All right, and I have this down here. So we're gonna, mo we're gonna figure out what this is, and then this is absolute value. We're gonna take the absolute value of it, okay? We are going to take that determinant called the Jacobian determinant and that is the part that tells us the part that scales. And that is, that is the part that I'm not going to explain to you, okay? 
I'm not going to explain why the Jacobian determinant gives us that scale factor. Is that all right? I mean, I guess it has to be all right. Don't, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to tempt myself, attempt, tempt myself to go down that road. It's something I'm willing to talk about in my office, but again, even if you came to my office, I'd be talking about things in chapter 13, late in chapter 13, I'd be talking about them right while I was trying to explain it. <laughs> we haven't been there, we haven't crossed the bridge. In fact, it was interesting because I was reading your textbook. Your textbook explains it, but they use stuff from later, which doesn't make sense. In other textbooks that I've seen, they actually say, this is not something that we can really show you right now. So I've seen it like approached in different ways. I'm not going to show it. There's your Jacobian determinant. Now, let's do something really cool. Let's show why, why with polar conversions we have to do R. Let's just show it, all right? So for polar, we use the fact that x is equal to, I'm going to do u cosine v again, and I'm going to do y is equal to u sine v. Now, I'll put the determinant up here so you don't re uh, forget it. Partial x with respect to u, partial y with respect to v, minus partial u with respect to v, times partial y with respect to u, and then we're going to take the magnitude of that. There is a shorter, more condensed notation for that, by the way. If um, the book will, will show it, um, they do this. Partial of um, u, oh uh, no, xy over partial uv. That's the notation the book uses. That means this. I, I just write it down. That way, the more you write that down, hopefully the faster. Yes? Which one? Oh, yep, yep, yep. This one's right here. Sorry, this is x. Thank you. x with respect to u, y with respect to v, minus x with respect to v, y with respect to u. All right, so let's see why with polar we have to throw an r in there. Now, actually, it's not going to be r for us. It's going to be what? u, right? Because I've changed r to u and theta to v. All right, so let's just, let's just compute the Jacobian determinant. So I'm going to take the absolute value of what is the partial of this equation with respect to u? Just cosine v. Because you're, you're um, treating u like a variable and cosine v like a constant. So derivative of u is 1 times cosine v. All right, times what is the derivative of y with respect to v? So when I do that, derivative of this part, right? is cosine v and then the, the u comes along. So u cosine v. And then minus now the partial of x with respect to v. So you're going to take derivative of this with respect to v. So just ignore the u. Derivative of cosine v is negative, negative sine v. So I'm going to have negative u sine v. And then finally the partial of y with respect to u, which is sine v. And then now, when we clean this up, this is equal to u cosine squared v plus, because we have two negatives, u sine squared v. And then we can factor u out, and we have the Pythagorean identity there, right? So this is u cosine squared v plus sine squared v. Uh, and then that's just u. So that's it. Okay, that's just to show you that that's where that comes from, all right? So let's do some problems. We're gonna, I'm going to try and do three examples here. Now, the first two examples I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a double integral, I'm going to give you a region, and I'm going to tell you what the change of variable needs to be. All right, so I'm going to give you the actual substitutions to make on the first two examples. On the third example, I'm not going to give you the substitution. You have to come up with it on your own. And that's 
harder to do. Right? So if, if during these first two examples you're sitting there going, how would I have known to use those two? I understand what you're saying. Yes, that would be difficult for you to come up with. But let's just see it act the actual mechanical process first. All right, so we're going to try and do double integral over R of e to the 4x minus y dA, where R is this region, R right here is the region, um, oh, it's actually, it's a parallelogram with vertices Three, three, seven, four, zero, zero, and four, one. All right, here we go. Let's draw the region first, just to get an idea of what it looks like. All right, so I've got the origin, 0, 0. Oh, I didn't give you the, forgot to give you the uh, transformations I want you to use. Um, use the transformation x is equal to 4u plus 3v, and y is equal to u plus 3v. So check out those transformations. That does not look like polar, right? We are not converting this using the polar transformation. This is some weird sort of linear transformation that we're doing, right? These are linear. In, in both u and v, they're both linear functions. So this is a linear transformation. So we have 0, 0. Let's go 3, 3 would be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Right there, that point. The point four one. So here's four one. Here's three three, and then seven four. So five six seven, and then here's four. I don't know, somewhere around there. So it's this parallelogram that's connecting those points like this. 7, 4. Okay. Now, what we need to figure out is what does this region get transformed into under this transformation? We know with polar, right? With polar, when we had that crazy looking polar region, like this, that when we transform that, it turned into a little nice little rectangle, didn't it? Hopefully, this will transform into something nice that we want to integrate over. Now, could you do this integral? Could you do this integral over this region? Yeah. You could. You would have to kind of split it up into parts, though. You would have to do maybe, it would almost be like a type 1. You would have to go from like here to here and do this function on top of this function, and then go from here to here, and it would be this on top of this piece, just right there, and then from here on it would be this one over that one, right? So you'd probably have to split this into three different integrals to do. But it could be done, yes? Alright, let's, let's proceed though and see what does this look like transformed. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to Try and figure out what the equations of these four little line segments are. And I'll start with the easiest, the easiest one. This little line segment right here, what is the equation of that line segment? Y equals x, or x equals y. And the reason why is because to get from here to there, you have up 3 over 3, right? So the slope is 1, and the y-intercept is... Zero, so that's the equation, right? Okay. Um, how about this one? This one might be easy to get also. What's the slope of this one? 
up one, rise over run, so y equals one up, four over, so one fourth x. What's the y-intercept of this line? Zero. So this is it? I'm just using this, y equals mx plus b. That's all I'm using, right? I did those two first because they both have a y-intercept of zero. So b is zero, so those were kind of easy as long as I could get the slopes. All right, let's do this one right here. What is this one? Well, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the slope of this line? What is it? The slope of this one. So if I wanted to go from here over, right, then that would be up one over four. So the slope is one fourth, isn't it? It's one fourth. But I don't have the y-intercept clearly, do I? So this goes back to college algebra. If somebody gives you two points, maybe even before college algebra, if someone gives you two points and asks you for the equation of the line through the two points, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. You can do that formula. We know the slope. The slope is 1 fourth. And then we use either one of these points, don't we? In here, so I'm going to use the 3 and 3. So y minus 3 equals 1 fourth, and then x minus 3. So I can get the, that's the equation of that line, isn't it? Saba, you all right? OK. So y minus 3 equals 1 fourth x minus 3 fourths. I'm going to just get it in slope intercept form. I'm just going to solve for y here. Any questions on what I'm doing? Okay, add three to both sides. So y is equal to one fourth x plus nine fourths. Okay, that's the equation of this line. Y equals one fourth x plus nine fourths. See, that y intercept was not very easy to get, right? I mean, we would maybe have a little bit of trouble getting that. All right. One more line segment. Let's see where this one goes. This one right here. What's this one? What's the slope? One. one. Right? So I'm basically going to do this same setup right here. I'm going to do the same thing I did here, but I'm going to do it with two different points. So I'm going to use the points uh, 4, 1 and 7, 4 y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. What did you say the slope was? One. one. Should be one if you do rise over run on this. Uh, y minus uh, one equals um, one and then x minus four, like that. And so you just move things around, you get y equals x minus three. All right, we good? Now, I erased our transformations because I needed some space, but I'll put the transformations back up on the board here. Oh, that's all right. This was 1 fourth x plus 9 fourths. OK, so to figure out where this region goes, what I'm going to do is try and figure out where these four line segments go. Where do they get taken? by this transformation. Understand? So my transformations, which I had erased earlier, were x was, what was it, 4u plus 3v, and y was u plus or minus? Plus again, plus 3v again. All right. So those are my transformations. Here we go. I'm going to start out by doing this one right here. Where does that go? Well, let's write that equation down. y equals x. If I'm looking at the equation y equals x, and I'm making the switch that x is this and y is this, then aren't I just setting these two equal to each other? Yes? yes? And if I set for you, uh, uh, sorry, I should put y on the left side y is uh, u plus 3v equal to x, which is 4u plus 3v. Something very nice happens here. 
the three V's cancel, right? And I get U is equal to four U. So you could subtract um, from both sides, you get like zero, zero equals three U. And that means U has to be zero. Right? U is zero. So this was a very clever choice of X and Y, wasn't it? Because it allowed this equation to become just z U is zero. Now, if I'm trying to figure out what this looks like, I'm going to draw over here what it looks like. This is now the transformation, the UV, okay, this transformation. What I know is that this equation here, or this line right here, this line segment right here, gets taken over to what? U is zero, which is really like what on this graph? It, the the V-axis. It's the whole V-axis. It's a line. Remember, if I ask you to graph x equals zero, it's a vertical line, isn't it? If I ask you to graph y equals zero, it's a horizontal line. This is saying that this line over here in this, re in this space gets transformed to this line in our new space. So we have that vertical line, u equals zero over here. Yes? That's nice. All right, let's try the next equation. Uh, let's do the 1 4th x. We'll do that one next. So if I do y equals 1 4th x, then I'm going to write down y, which is u plus 3v, equals 1 4th times that. So 1 4th times 4u plus 3v. And then just distribute the 1 4th through and see what happens. U plus 3V equals U plus 3 fourths V. And yes, the U's will cancel now, right? If you subtract U on both sides, gone. You get 3V equals 3 fourths V. What's the only way that can be true? If V is zero. So same thing, you can move all your V's to one side and then you know, there's only one solution. So V must be zero. So that means if I look at this line segment right here, right, that line segment turns into V equals zero over here, which is the U axis. This is a pretty clever choice, isn't it? All right, let's do uh, the next one. Uh, we've done this one and that one. Let's do this one. Y equals X minus 3. What is that getting taken to? So U plus 3V equals 4U plus 3V. That's X, then minus 3. And the V terms cancel again. Let's get all our U's on one side. So we'll subtract 4U from both sides. We get negative 3U equals 3, which means U is, oh, sorry, equals negative 3. U is 1. Good. That's really good to see. Because that means that this piece right here, gets taken over to u equals 1. So if this is 1, it's a vertical line through here, right? It's looking like a pretty good region over here, isn't it? I will say something. These line segments do not get mapped over to s entire lines. They get mapped over to line segments. So what I would have to do to figure out what the line segment is is I'd have to say, what are the restrictions um, on this green one? What are the restrictions on X? And what are the restrictions on Y? And then somehow that will dictate our restrictions on U and V. But we don't need it, because this is about to close off a region. Yes? How do you know that uh, V is the vertical axis of I could have done it the other way. The question is, why is V the, this vertical axis and U is here? It doesn't matter. I could have called this U, I mean, sorry, this V and that U. And it's OK. Your picture, it'll just be like, Switching X and Y, that's all. I mean, it would just be the same picture, just from a different perspective. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Now, you can't do that in three-dimensional. 
Three-dimensional, you have the right-hand rule, so it's not as, as clean and easy, but here you can do it. Um, all right, last one. This one right here. This is supposed to be a Y. I erased the bottom of it. So we're going to do Y equals 1 fourth X plus 9 fourths. Okay, so U plus 3V, that's Y, equals 1 fourth of X. Didn't we do 1 fourth of X earlier? Yeah. It's just U plus 3 fourths V and then plus 9 fourths. And our U's cancel again. I subtract, so I'm doing 3V minus 3 fourths V equals 9 fourths. Yeah, so the left side is 9 fourths V equals 9 fourths, which means V is 1. And V is 1 over here, that's this line right, segment right here. That's going to be V is 1, this is this line segment like this. So can you see the region? Very, very nice region here, isn't it? Well, that was a lot of work. <laughs> and you might argue that you've already, you would have already been finished with this one already. But uh, this is the first example. It's just to get you to see how, how it goes. Some problems you just can't do here. You need a transformation. Um, something else I want to state. Is there an easier way we could have done this and got this? What if we would have just picked the points just taking the points and seeing where the points go instead of the whole line segments. So like what if I would have looked at the point zero, zero? Would, could I have gotten anything from that? Like if, if I use zero, zero, the question is where does that go? Where does zero, zero go? So what would happen is you would take the transformation and you would replace x with zero and you would replace y with 0, right, like that. Then you try and solve this system of equations, which you could do this system of equations by multiplying this row by negative 1 and then adding straight down. And if you did that, what would you get? 3u is 0, and then u is 0, right? Once you know what u is, you can go back and get v. And you would actually figure out from this that v is 0 also. So that would mean that this point right here, this point right here, got taken to 0, 0 here. And you could have done that for all four points. And then you would have had just the four corners, and then you would have been done. The reason I didn't do that is because that only works for linear transformations, meaning these were linear, right? So if they're linear, the points will go to points, but, this, but the lines will go to lines. So that means this line segment goes to a line segment. This line segment goes to a line segment. Linear transformation, lines go to lines. If this transformation is nonlinear, like polar coordinates, Polar is nonlinear. Do you all understand that that tr transformation is nonlinear? X is U cosine V. Um, y is equal to U sine V. You understand that these are not linear? Okay. So nonlinear transformations like this, lines don't go to lines necessarily. You could have parabolas go to lines. And so if you were to just, let's say that that transformation was not linear and you knew that you had over here, the, you knew where the points went. You cannot draw straight lines between these if it's a nonlinear transformation. That's why I didn't show you that method. Because it could be like this, it could be like that, and then maybe that's a line, and then maybe that's a line, and then this one down here could be some other function like that. Now that's still a preferable thing to integrate compared to that, right? Because it's just a, a, like a type 1 region. 
Yes, do you all understand what I'm saying? Okay, now you can, you can map the points over just to get you some reference points if you want, but if it's nonlinear, that's all they are is reference points. Okay, we haven't finished the problem, right? We have not finished the problem. Well, we have an idea now is of what the transformation of the region looks like. So let's go ahead and put that up here. What we know now um, is that our region of integration looks like this. Right? So we could say that our u is trapped between two constants and our v is trapped between two constants. Very, very nice region to integrate over. So now what I need to do is transform that integral that was in terms of x and y into a new integral that's in terms of, of u and v. But when I do that, there's the give and the take. There's the Jacobian determinant, right? So I need to go grab that Jacobian determinant now. So to get the Jacobian determinant, which is this, let's go ahead and just calculate it here. I'm just going to put j for Jacobian determinant. It's the partial, partial of x with respect to u. So what's the partial of this with respect to u? 4 times partial of um, y with respect to v is 3 minus partial of x with respect to v, 3, and then 1. And that's just 12 minus 3, that's 9. So somehow in that transformation, we have to scale the area by 9 in order to make this work. Notice it's not a variable, right? This is not a variable. With the polar conversion, it is a variable, isn't it? That's because the polar conversion, again, is nonlinear. If they're linear transformations, you will always have a number as your Jacobian determinant. Only in linear transformations. <laughs> in linear algebra, you study just linear transformations? You don't do nonlinear transformations, right? Yeah. All right, let's do it. We're, we're ready to convert this. So this integral now converts over into 0 to 1, 0 to 1. Will it matter which way I put my variables here? Like no. du, dv, doesn't matter because they're both between constants. Now I need to rewrite the function. It's e to the 4x. 4 times x means 4 times this, right? So so 16u, what is it, plus 12v, right? Isn't that 4x, 4 times this? And then minus y, so minus u plus 3v. And then that's all up in the exponent, times what? 9, and then d, doesn't matter, v du. It absolutely has, it makes no difference because these are both from 0 to 1 and they're both constants. All right, let's clean that up. This is the integral from 0 to 1, integral 0 to 1, um, e to the 6, 15, 15u, and then you should have a 12 there, plus 9v. Oh, let's pull that 9 out. Sorry, I should have pulled that 9 out a long time ago. D, V, D, U. Okay, what did I do here? I split it. Instead of writing E to the 15U plus 9V, I split it into two because if, if I have a double integral, and one, if, if I have two factors, right, and one of them has U's in it but no V's, and this one has V's in it and no U's, I can split this into two separate integrals and multiply their results. That's why I, I did that step. So 9 times integral 0 to 1 of e to the 15u du plus times multiply square what what do I do here? Times integral 0 to 1 e to the 9v uh, dv. And the 9 that's out here is just 
got pulled out and just chilling. just chilling, yep. I can only do that because there's no U over here, right? And there's no V over here. That's the only reason I can split them. And we've come this far. It's what, taking me 45 minutes to get to this? So let's go ahead and um, integrate that. So we've got the 9 here. Okay, the antiderivative of this is 1 15th e to the 15 u, right? Yes? Yeah, and let me put this 9 way out there. And I'm going to evaluate that 0 to 1. And then minus, or not minus, times, oops, times antiderivative of this. 1 ninth e to the 9v, and that's evaluated 0 to 1. This is equal to 9. It's going to look a little weird. Wow, this is really bad notation. OK. Um, it's, I need to do one more thing here before I continue. I put two sets of parentheses here so I can figure out what this is, right? Two sets of parentheses here for this. These are being multiplied, right? So I actually need that in parentheses and that in parentheses also. And the 9 is just sitting out there waiting to multiply the final answer. All right, let's plug 1 into this. What do you get if you plug in 1, one to this? E to the 15th. E, 1 15th, e to the 15th. What about if I plug in 0? E to 0 is 1, so you just get 1 15th. And then here, 1 9th, e to the 9th. And then here, 1 ninth. And I think we've got all numbers there now, so I'll just leave it at that. So you, you could argue that that was not any easier, like that didn't make your life any better. I mean, I, can, I get that. But it sure did help with polar coordinates, didn't it? All right, let's try another one. I, I went back and watched my homework solutions for this section. Not, I think I watched like half of it. I watched it last night. I was trying to fall asleep, so I was just sitting there watching it. And uh, I put myself to sleep. Um, but uh, yeah, I was very unenthusiastic when I was working the problems. I'm just like, oh, I think I was sick or something, because I was just like, uh, uh. am I like that on all the videos? You can be honest. No, oh, okay, was that it? All right. Because I seem really out of it in those. Okay, so this is the new integral we're going to try and do. And the region, the region for this that we're integrating over is inside the ellipse x squared minus xy plus y squared equals 2. So here's what the transformation is. Remember, I've got to give you this part, at least for this one. You're not going to like this. x is equal to root 2u minus root 2 thirds v. y is equal to root 2u plus root 2 thirds v. 
this u is not underneath this root. This u is not underneath this root. This v is not underneath this root, okay? These are outside the roots. There's our transformation. Oh, wow. Okay, so first of all, what does our region R look like? Well, it says it's an ellipse, right? All right, so um, I don't know. It's not, a, it's not uh, lines, right? It's not lines. It's curved. That's the main point. It's curved. That means I can't sit there and say, oh, what's the slope of the line? And let's see where that line segment goes. I can't do that. All right? But I can work with this equation. And I can try and see if this equation gives me any information about what the transformation would look like. So if I take just this equation and I replace x with this and y with this, I wonder what happens. All right, so this is our R. The question is, what does S look like? S, the transformed region. Did I use S earlier? I don't know if I did. OK, this is, the tr this is the region we're starting with. This is our transformed region. OK. So let's plug in. This is going to be fun with algebra. All right, x squared is this squared, right? So I'm going to write that down. That's root 2u minus root 2 thirds v. That's squared. That's x squared. All right. Minus x root 2u minus root 2 thirds v times y, which is root 2u plus root 2 thirds v. And then finally, plus y squared, which is root 2u plus root 2 thirds v, that quantity squared. We get to do a little bit of work here. All right, what happens when you square this? That squares, so you get 2u squared. How about the middle terms? Minus, yeah, there's different ways we can write this. I'm going to write it like this just so hopefully everyone can see what's happening. Root 2 times uh, root 2 thirds uv. So you're basically multiplying this times this and doubling it and keeping the sign of what's in the middle. So it'll be negative 2. 2 of what? These two multiplied. So I just did root 2 times root 2 thirds. I understand that becomes another, the root 2 and root 2 become a 2, and that comes out and becomes a 4. But I'm just leaving it like that so you can see what what's happening there. Then what about this last one? Plus 2 thirds v squared. OK, that wasn't so bad. What about these two in the middle? They're difference of squares, aren't they? This is a difference of squares formula. So the middle parts are going to cancel out. And all you're going to get is this thing squared and that thing squared, but subtracted. So it'll become minus 2u squared. And then what? This was already a minus, so another minus will be plus 2 thirds v squared. This one squared. Same, it's, we have a plus in the middle, so it's basically this thing in the middle we had here, or this first one, but with a plus sign. So plus 2u squared plus 2 root 2 root 2 thirds uv plus 2 thirds v squared. Um, I forgot something important here. Equals 2. Equals 2. Remember, I was using this equation, right? And I was replacing everything, x and y. And I have an equals 2 out there. I'm not sure. Yeah, that should come out on camera. Does that look pretty ugly? I think some good things happen here. Um, this big old junky thing that I wasn't going to want to clean up cancels out with this one over here. That's nice. And I think I get a u squared, uh, 2u squared. That goes away, that goes away. That one doesn't, though. How about the v squareds? Any of those go away? Mm -mm. So let's see what we've got. We've got 2u squared. I'm going to write this. I'm going to put it right up here. 2u squared. And then I've got 2 thirds v squared, 2 thirds v squared, 2 thirds v squared. That's three of the 2 thirds, three, uh, two thirds, 
v squared, which is just 2v squared, right? So this is plus 2v squared, and that's it, right? Equals 2. And if I divide everything by 2, I get u squared plus v squared equals 1. Which means that I just mapped the ellipse over to a unit circle. Now, am I comfortable integrating over a unit circle? Yes. Yes? How will I need to do that? Go to polar. So I'm going to have to do a second change of variables at this point. What? Okay. But do you all see what happened here? This region that I didn't want to integrate over just became a nice polar region for me. Yeah? All right. Time to erase some stuff here. Um, I'm about to do a conversion over to from xy to uv. Once I get to uv, I'm going to have to go to r theta. All right? Okay. Let's get it to uv first because when we go from xy to uv, we have to include the Jacobian determinant, right? That must be included. So let's get our Jacobian. Our Jacobian is going to be the partial of x with respect to u. Just the square root. Just root 2. Partial of y with respect to v. Root 2, root two over 3. Uh, sorry, root the whole thing. Root two-thirds. Okay, minus partial of x with respect to v. Negative, Negative root, I keep doing it, root two-thirds. And then partial of y with respect to u. Root two. Root two. All right, now it's time to actually do this. This right here, when I put it together, becomes two over root three, right? Minus, minus, plus another 2 over root 3, which is 4 over root 3. That's my scaling factor that I need if I'm going to make this change of variables. And that's, that's just going to come out of the integral. I'm just going to pull it all the way out because it's a, it's a, it's a constant, right? It's kind of strange because I told you that I told you that if you do a linear transformation, your Jacobian will always be constant, right? Was this a linear transformation? No. no. So this is, a mathy, this is kind of a mathy thing, a logic thing. I said all linear transformations create constants. I did not say all constants mean you had a linear transformation. It's two different statements, right? So you can have a nonlinear transformation that gives you a Jacobian that's, that's a constant, but that doesn't mean that it had to be linear. P then Q. That's right. It's the if P then Q. If P, P implies Q does not mean Q implies P. All right. Um, let's try and rewrite this integral right now. So this new integral is a new integral over the region S. Right? Now I'm going to put S here because I drew it on the board. This is what S is. And that is going to have a Jacobian determinant of 4 root 3 that's going to be pulled out. And what is it that I'm integrating? Well, I've got to rewrite this, don't I? Rewrite this with all these substitutions plugged in. But we did this earlier. This is the exact same expression as what we were integrating over. So that turned out to be what? It was, it was only the left side. It was 2u squared plus 2v squared. Right? That was the left side. So this becomes 2u squared plus 2v squared. And then dA with respect to area. The reason why I'm not putting any limits of integration on and I'm not assigning any, like, du, dv, I'm not doing that, is because I'm about to go to polar, right? Why, am I saying that this dA is the same as this dA? 
No, because it's actually 4 over root 3 dA, but I pulled the constant out. So I'm still integrating with respect to area. Now, 